Mr. Kirk DeWint, you're looking really good today. Why, thank you. I was hoping you'd notice. Mm-hmm. I did. Yeah, you, these time slots we have right here for our recording, for those who aren't in the know of stalking our lives on a very intimate level, Kirk finishes a workout generally right now and then scrambles to sometimes get a shower in and sometimes cram some food into his face. Uh-huh. If it's a really big day, I'll see him with a Coke. <laughs> Not a, a big day. That's his reward for after a workout. But today he shows up. He's got his facial hair is all lined up. Mustache is popping. He's got product in his hair and is just put together. This is not a fresh out of the shower. Maybe it is, but it's not a still dripping wet, kind of maybe the sweating from the workout still. This is a runway ready, Kirk. You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, God, I look like shit. (laughs) You can do better. (laughs) It was one of those days today. It's birthday week, Bracken. And you're right. right. Normally, Normally when you see us like our video clips of the podcast on our social media. I, I've i gotten done with a workout five minutes earlier. I throw a baseball cap on and we record. So I, 90% of the time I have mm-hmm. a, a hat on. But today I, I had 10 minutes to spare, Bracken. And I thought, let's let's fluff it up a mm. little bit for you. And you haven't shaven. I can tell that you've, uh, you're have you unkept. Well, I'm like, I'm, I, I stay with some stubble. Lisa yeah. greatly prefers me with stubble. And I think it's part of that, like, if you don't have hair on top, something has to balance out just the pale pink skin of your head. So mm. I don't grow a ton of facial hair, but it's just a sprinkling. I think your eyebrows are enough. Oh, they are they pull their weight and then some. Mm-hmm. Hey, I um, I was looking at, right, so, uh, okay. was looking at Apple Podcasts this morning, and we brought up this whole thing about uh, reviews and such, and um, I'm starting to see them filter in. There's like a 24 to 48 hour venting process that Apple Podcasts goes through before they actually appear, and they're starting to curate. So people listened to us on Friday or Saturday and actually went and wrote a few reviews. So to those that went and gave us a rating or review, thank you. Uh, they're just starting to pop in, so we'll see what, uh, what the numbers end up coming out at. But uh, somebody listened. It's great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, we are going to be the nineteenth best bachelor related running podcast next year, <laughs> at least. All right, so I interrupted in you. the You're bachelor say extended universe. <laughs> I was going to transition us because it uh, there's a topic that I have been dealing with recently in writing programming, okay. and that the national series for Spartan Race is upon us. Big Bear's coming up, Utah's yep. looming, and it's close enough to the Seattle North American Regional Championships that people are starting to think about that. And on top of that, the ultra season is really kicking into into full gear. It starts off really just down in basically Arizona, Florida, yep. California early in the year in North America, or at least in the United States. And now it's starting to filter up. You've got Utah, Idaho, Colorado. They're starting to have their mountain passes open, and they yep. start holding races. So people are running races that they've run in the past. And I am doing that balancing act right now, Kirk DeWint, of what is the best training plan for someone and what is a novel new way of accomplishing that same training goal. And this is something that... I struggle with as a coach, and I'll be very, very open and honest about this. I struggle with this as a coach because as an athlete, I don't require change, right. micro change at best. I can run the same training plan year in and year out, and when I was at my best, I did, and I made micro changes. I would tweak the duration of a rep or how many reps I got in that week versus a previous training block. But they were the same routes, the same segments, the same distances. I was just a creature of habit, and it's trackable. So I struggle a little bit with adding novelty for novelty's sake because I don't believe it's necessary for an athlete physically. Mm -hmm. And the floor is yours. Yeah, I can relate to that, Brackenstein. I think... um, I think as a coach, well, well, why don't we do this, actually, to start. Uh, the floor doesn't need to be mine quite yet, but um, you have a quote that you want to you wanna kind of yeah, follow up your, your intro with, and I think you should read it. I think you should read this quote. Well, 
you've all seen the title of the episode. <laughs> you have an idea of what we're going to rage against today, which is variety. Um, but in case you're someone who is not reading episode titles, you're just so blindly in love with everything we put out. You just <laughs> have to hit play before you even have time to read it. The title of today's episode is Variety is Not the Spice of Your Training Life. And so I'm leading off with the most vanilla, non-spiced outlook on training you'll ever hear. All right, here's the quote. I do this workout, and he's referring to 25 by 400 meters with 45 to 60 seconds rest. Mm -hmm. I do this workout every week. It's one of the sessions we have done the most. Our program is set from Monday through Sunday, October through April. Been the same for 15 years with some minor adjustments. So let's do some math here. October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Seven months out of the year. Mm -hmm. For 15 straight years, this individual has done the same interval workout once per week. Every Thursday. The program is set in stone seven months out of the year for 15 years. And, and that individual is Jakob Ingebrigtsen, the reigning Olympic champion and arguably the best distance runner of our generation. How's that for spice? It's not spicy at all. But clearly there's, there's no something spice to there, it. <laughs> well... Let's piggyback your intro then. Okay. And I think that's I think that's a good place to start with this is changing things up for variety's sake, which there is an argument for, to stay mentally engaged. People mm -hmm. some people love a process, some people get bored with a process and just need new and bright, flashy things yes. thrown at them to stay engaged. So there are two types of people, right? One who could do the same workout every mm -hmm. week with micro adjustments or working on micro improvements. And that's all they need. If I was a tenth of a second faster on average for my 25 by a quarter mile repeat, that is a big win. And that is enough to move me down to the next week and look forward to the next one. Whereas a different athlete could see that workout pop up twice in three months and be like, I'm not doing that workout again. I did that workout three months ago. That's ridiculous. Right. Right. <laughs> and so as a coach, mm -hmm. I could not agree more that we constantly waffle between should I give you what's the best for you or should I give you basically the same thing in disguise and make it look another way but accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we're getting to that time of year where uh, lead-in to big races matter if you've been at this a long time. Um, the the lead-in may have sort of be figured out and so you'll see repeat workouts on plans or you'll waffle over do i give them a new workout the week of a race just for novelty sake or do we stick with what we know and so all those rattle around i think every coach's head right and so i don't think you're alone there i've been mm -hmm. dealing with that myself so what do you do with all that how do you how do you uh yeah you've hit that a bit navigate through this well i start with an analogy kirk that's what I do. Shocking. And the concept is, if we're talking about <laughs> variety is the spice of life, well, spice is most connected to, outside of Dune, is most connected to food. And if you think about flavorful, spicy, robust, palate-rocking flavors, is that what you want to have before a race for breakfast? No. Is that what you want to have before a workout, before a long run, before an interval session? No. Is it maybe what you want afterwards or 10 hours later or the next day? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And so my, my point here, which is pretty obvious, is are you eating for fuel, for performance, or are you eating for pleasure? Hmm. And that determines what you're going to do. On race morning, you get up and you, unless you are a freak of nature, you cannot eat for pleasure. There is no pleasure in eating on race morning. 
It is mm. simply a chore. Like you say, the body does what it's told. It doesn't want food, but you must chew something mm. to chew up and, and send down lower into your body so that you can get something out of it. And that's mm. all it is. It's a process. It's an act of doing something that means nothing to you. It's just an action that gets a reaction. And the more bland the food is, the easier it goes down. And the more reliable it's going to go down. And the more reliable it is that it's going to stay down. Mm -hmm. And that is all anyone needs to know. We could stop right now how <laughs> I feel about training. If you are training for performance, <clears throat> you want bland. You want it to go down and stay down and you want to know exactly how many calories am I getting out of this meal. And if you're training for excitement, then you're training for pleasure and yeah, spice it up a bit. And of course, there's a meeting ground in the middle. But just right off the bat, that's what I want to lead with. Are we eating for pleasure or are we eating for fueling and performance? Are you training to run the best you can run or are you training to love running? And there's a distinct line in the sand. And I think athletes need to know which side of this, that line they are on and which side their brain is on because it's not always the same thing. But that's where I want to kick off today with that analogy. Well, and do you have a, do you have a strong opinion on which is best? I eat for... I don't think there is best, right? I'm sure. Which one personal. is, which one will, you, you, okay, let's equate food and the body to. But yes, I can give you a, yes, I'll give you a yes, Kirk. Yes. Okay. Bland What's is yours? best. Well, well Bland you. Is best. Let, let's, let's make this superficial, actually. Just let's take your analogy one step further. And let's say mm -hmm. you eat for function and you eat for pleasure and you take your shirt off at the beach, mm -hmm. and you look like you take care of yourself. You're not all the way happy with how you look, but you're you're there and you're hat content enough, right? Now, let's say if you exclusively... You're not ashamed. You're not ashamed, right. You're just comfortable. You're semi-comfortable at the beach with your shirt off. Now you eat for performance, and all you care about is being shredded and looking good all baby oiled up. You take that shirt off, and you're like, ka -chee, ka -chee, and you're like, look at me, I'm jacked. That's exactly the mm -hmm. same way it works with training. If you want to be bland and, uh, let's say, periodized and purposeful, you're going to get that extra percent, <laughs> which is the equivalent of the guy at the beach, versus take your shirt mm -hmm. off, show up to race day, be semi-comfortable that what you've done is enough that you can be there and, I don't know, exist somewhat happily, right? And so... That, that that analogy actually is kind of yeah. true. We don't talk about looks very often on this podcast, but the same goes for performance. That extra few percent body fat is that extra few percent in performance. And I don't think the variety necessarily is the best way to achieve the top of both, which is really echoing what you yeah. had said. And I'm going to take it even a step farther. Okay. Oh, continue that thought, and then I'm going to expand upon this weird analogy even more. No, I'd like go go down the rabbit hole. So if you start out and the first thing you eat is the most flavorful plate that you can find, where do you go from there? Not to broccoli. What happens when it's time for just rice and broccoli and chicken? That feels like a step backwards. Yeah. If you start bland and now you discover salt for the first time... And a month later, you discover pepper oh. and then garlic and, and your paprika. And throughout your life, you have room for micro changes that move the needle for your taste buds. If you're at a Michelin star restaurant right from the start, as soon as you discover solid foods, you are set up for a lifelong quest to feel something. Now you need variety to feel anything because it doesn't do anything for your palate anymore. That is the exact same way working out works. Exact. There is no difference there. If you start with all the variety and spice, you're stuck. You have to search for more. And now I need mm. crazier rep schemes. And now I need spicier workouts or more convoluted, complicated sets. Where mm -hmm. if you just start by running 24 by 400, 25 by 400 in this example, and then later on you change to 600s or 300s or 800s, like, whoa. This is a heck of a workout here, boys. Mm. There is no difference between these two. Hmm. I think that drove the point home. Um, variety for variety's sake 
moves the needle less effectively than, let's say, a steady straight line plan or execution of um, not necessarily simple workouts, yeah. but um, let's call predictable workouts. So, okay, we hammered that's that home. That's the key word right Predictable. There. Predictable. Right. Um, and, and so let, let's take this then and make it more applicable. So some examples. Now, I will say, uh, not my fault, but this isn't a fault. It's a, it's trickery, we will call it. I know most athletes do like variety. <laughs> it is perceived as lazy coaching by the masses if you give somebody the exact same workout you gave them in recent times. He just took that workout and gave it to me again. What lazy coaching that is, right? So as coaches, what we mm-hmm. do to avoid that conversation is, okay, we do three, we do 10 by three minutes with one minute rest today. And next week we do six by five minutes with two minutes rest. And then the next we do whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. But really what's happening is we're getting you into yep. the same metabolic stimulus range. We're changing the work to rest ratios. But ultimately, unless we're working on specific pacing, we believe in systems work, we're just like, okay, so we want to work threshold this week. What are one of the thousand ways we could creatively put together a workout so this athlete spends enough time in threshold, does what I want them to do without it looking like we're just taking the same workout and repeating it week after week and just collecting our paycheck, Mm -hmm. right? And so I know you fall victim to this, and I do too, and a couple of recent conversations with athletes brought this to like about same strength workouts or same quality sessions, even from like a year ago, being like, we did that workout leading into a race a year ago. I thought I'd get something different. It's like a year in between stuff, like, holy smokes, We're talking about the need for variety. And so walk <laughs> and this yeah. is with people making their own training plans too. Um, the need for variety versus the need for what's effective. And so you have two schools of thought as a coach and you say, I can avoid that conversation of like, you don't change things up enough. So just trick them in a sense, give them the work I want them to do, but just mask, Mm -hmm. put makeup on it and make it look a little different, but it's really achieving the same thing or follow a very steady progression like Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who seven months a year does the same workout with micro adjustments. Where do you fall on that? And this not only goes to coaches or those who have coaches, Um, but those who write their own training, which most of you listening probably do, right? Like, what are your thoughts? Where do you land on all that? How do you navigate that as a coach? Mm -hmm. Well, anyone who talks with me about running, including in particularly the athletes I work with, have heard this, me say this over and over again, which is, I want to change as few variables as possible right now. I'd like to start with one so that we know exactly what caused what's about to happen next and let's run that until we're confident in it and now let's adjust another one so i'm very much on the bland side let me interrupt right away what would be an example of that like let's just change what like somebody comes to you or you're progressing to the Mm -hmm. next training block like what would be an example of one variable you would change well an example of a new athlete coming over being like i've stagnated here's what i've been doing give me what i should do I say, what I'd rather do is keep doing the strength work you've been doing. Mm. Keep running the volume you've been running. And I'm going to change your two quality (laughs) workouts per week. And one of them is pretty close to what I would do anyway. We're going to keep that every other week. And the other one, I'm going to change to something that's more in line with with what I believe will give you progression anaerobically. So we're not touching your volume yet. We're not touching your strength work. Even if I don't think your strength work is great, or if I think it's not even useful, which there is no such thing really as unuseful strength work. Right. Let's not touch it right now because if three weeks from now you're really fatigued or you're really popping or you're injured, I don't want to have to guess, was it this thing we changed or was it that thing we changed? Because now the second round is now we have to isolate a variable. And if we right. guess wrong again, now we've lost two training cycles of production because of that. So just from a logical standpoint, I want to start with the most repeatable most sustainable anything, whether it's lifting, long runs, spicy workouts, boring workouts, volume, and then I'm going to change one thing out of that. 
And we're going to do that for a few weeks, long enough that we know it should take root by now. And let's see, like if we were going to fatigue, we would know it by now. And now let's do the second thing. And then after like six weeks or so, all right, let's change your strength training. And now let's see how that affects your overall fatigue. So I'm sequential like that in everything I do to a fault. You know, that will turn some people off. And, and, but that is the way that if you don't have a lab at your disposal, if you're just working with yourself, you're training yourself, you're writing your own programming, it's the safest place to start is I can't test for everything. So I'm not going to try to change everything. Mm. Yeah. Isolate what's doing what that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, instead of throwing a bunch of ingredients in the pot and then wondering which one made it taste so good, right? Or so bad, exactly. I suppose. Now, what do I take out next time? Right. Um, okay, I can get on board with that. So back to my question then. I'm going to say that I err on the side of actually more variety, although I will repeat workouts through cycles, of course, especially lead-ins to big races. It'll, an athlete will see OCR mile repeats or Uphill OCR 90s for sure are two staples mm -hmm. within three weeks of a workout for my OCR athletes. Two one intervals the week of a race are like three, two, one, or two, one are like prime. You're going to see things like that pop up because I believe it's just the right amount of stimulus, you know, pre workout. But mm -hmm. I'm going to say I err on the side of um, the other end of the spectrum. And I have athletes that I think are going to disagree with me on the programming standpoint. But um, changing things up week to week, month to month, where they don't see the same workout repeated for months at a time. Although it's what I think accomplishing mm -hmm. the same thing. I could probably benefit from more. Like, for example, I know you have athletes who you might do like, okay, we're going to do five by a thousand today. Next week, we're going to do six by a thousand. The following week, seven by a thousand. And the sole mission is to maintain the same pacing, but extend it at one rep further. I do very little of that, for right. example. Um, so what do you find yourself programming? Do you find yourself repeatability or masquerading the same stimulus with a different workout? Um, I do more. And I think to be fair to both of us, we're on opposite ends of the spectrum on the same end of the pool. Sure. Like we're both in the shallow end. I'm at the 18 inch deep line. You're at the 36 inch deep line, but we're both <laughs> right. in the shallow end. <laughs> right. So, so yes, we are different, but the same kind of thing. Uh, what, what I do, for, I'll start with, with OCR athletes, since that's where this podcast stemmed from. Let's pay them their, their due, their dues here. So with OCR athletes, my boring stuff is my engine work, the threshold work, the long mm -hmm. runs, the aerobic runs, the intervals. That's very vanilla and it's very repeatable. And the spice comes in the forms of how do we compromise run? Because compromise running is less easy to nail down a precise metric. Sure. Even in one workout like our OCR 400s or OCR miles, if you're doing burpees versus hand release push ups versus walking lunges or tuck jumps, like your heart rate's going to do different things off that anyway. So comparing even one OCR 400 to another heart rate wise is kind of hard to check. Overall mm -hmm. pace is good and RPE is nice, but it's much more RPE uh, or heart rate during long run reps. But during short ones, it's all over the place anyway. So that's where I'll change spice. Sure. I might do Bigfoot one week and KDE another and OCR 400s one and Hobie Tempo one and Mount Majestic one and Duck Pond another. But they're all working on compromised running and race skills. But then going down the line, it's just three minute reps, five minute reps, three minute reps, seven minute reps, three minute reps, five minutes, right. just over and over and over down the line on our, let's just call them Tuesdays. For a regular runner, I kind of masquerade a little bit with angle. So it's three minute reps on Tuesday. Next week, it's incline three minute reps. Right. And it's five minute flat, then five minute incline. And then we'll do a fart lick. And then we'll do that again. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do a fart lick and then we'll do that again. And so it's variety, but it's not true change of the spice. It's just you're running. One of them is slightly more hill rappy and the other one is flat. And then let's say you have an athlete. Say, I don't know. I've had athletes. I've got athletes going on six years. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Three to six yeah. years, right? And so you go through these cycles of years and years. Like, when might it make sense to run said athlete again through the five-minute flat, five-minute uphill, right? Like, how often might you prescribe, like, even on a larger scale? Mm. For me, it might be 
two to four times a year, depending at least twice, but probably more yeah. frequently, the exact same progression and build or the exact same workout. What about you? Yeah. I would say, yeah, two to four, two probably for sure at minimum. Yeah. I'm going to do a bad job answering this because I, I don't even, I don't know if I have the ability to think about how many times we're doing it. It's more of how many times are we deviating from it to get ready for a race? Oh, sure. sure. Like that's where we live. Sure. We live, we live three to 15 minute reps year round. And then we deviate it for like a quick off season or for a race prep or coming out of a race. Uh, we don't, <laughs> I don't really implement those reps. I, I pivot away from them from time mm-hmm. to time when we're just absolutely forced to. <laughs> it's so, it's so funny because as a coach, don't you just, so it's all about like, I mean, the process is what should keep us coming back, but racing are the mm-hmm. highlight points on the calendar every year. Right. But like, as a coach, I love, give me like a three month period where somebody isn't racing and we can just work and we don't mm-hmm. have to, we don't have to deviate from like a, an idea of grandeur and these, this lay in pavement. Cause then we got to mess it all up and race, which is such a backwards way to look at it because as a coach, it's so satisfying to program progression. And then you're like, Oh, we gotta, we gotta pivot yeah. now and get ready for a race, which is why we do it. And I don't know if you ever feel the same way where like as a coach, it's just so fun to be able to build and build and build. And then as you mentioned, deviate from your plan so we can get ready to race, which is the point. But I find myself interestingly enough feeling that way at times. And then you get into racing season where people are racing every two to mm-hmm. four weeks and then it all goes to crap. And then you're like, okay, how do we maintain, right. maintain, maintain, recover, which is what we're entering in now, which becomes where I believe the trickiest time to be a coach or an athlete is, is figuring it all out amongst races. But do you ever find yourself just loving that build phase without the in quotes distraction of racing? Every single time. It's my favorite Lisa, part. Lisa, it's 11, coaching. 11. What? Yeah. So you said three month. What was if that little blip there? Block, what would you do with that? What was that little blip you just said? <laughs> I said Lisa, Lisa, it's, it's 11, 11. 11. <laughs> Why? Is that a thing yeah, you guys 11, do? 11, 11 a.m. 11, 11, make a wish. She loves 11, 11. Okay, shout out Lisa and 11, 11. Continue. She, if she's listening, she'll hear it. And if not, then it's lost to the, to the universe. All right. If you just gave someone suddenly, you gave me three months, here's what I'm doing with it <laughs> every single time. Just if I'm looking down my Tuesday lineup, I'm going three minute flat, three minute uphill, five minute flat, five minute uphill, seven minute flat, seven minute uphill. It got me through six weeks. Now I get to reset and do it again better. Right. <laughs> I am so excited <laughs> to reset and go through that again. Three, three, five, five, seven, seven. And if it's not that, maybe it's three, five, three, five, three, five. And then I'm maybe moving up to like six, nine, six, nine, six, nine or something. Either way, I'm going through six weeks of progression mm-hmm. and then I'm champing at the bit to repeat that. And now I've just got two solid training blocks in and I couldn't be happier. It's a relief to not have races on the calendar if you're training for performance. It's exciting to go race, but it's a relief to be able to just build. Yeah. Um, I just didn't know if that was if I was alone there, but clearly I'm not. And you, you more than anybody loves a good linear progression. So what do you think about... Um, well, th- yes. Well, you, you, we've joked on here sometimes that I've had like a 30 week build or a 50 week build and Mm -hmm. people are like, that's ridiculous. Like, well, it's not, (laughs) I can do 12 weeks of threshold work. I'm going to do a slightly speedier for six and I'm going to do, and that's 18 weeks. And now I'm going to do that again. And now that's a 36 week build, (laughs) like 12 weeks of threshold, sharpen up and race, test it out. And I'm going to do 12 more weeks and then six weeks sharp and race. Like that's, that's not a crazy build. And it's easy when I'm not trying to figure out what workouts I'm going to be doing. <laughs> I'm going to be running thousands. I'm going to run in miles. I'm going to be hitting split tempos. And I'm just going to recycle them over and over and over. And then I'm going to sharpen. That's it. Like, that's a 36-week build, Kirk. I just did it mm-hmm. in 20 wow. seconds. <laughs> it's not that complicated. And it's not as crazy as it would sound by saying, oh, I wrote out a 36-week progression. <laughs> Maybe you're just a, a genius, a programming wizard of or sorts. Or a simpleton. Or a simple, or, or a Neanderthal monkey man. I don't know, somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, okay, and we are going to teach you something today, folks. So we're kind of giving you our opinion 
basically don't distract yourself with Flash or Flash isn't the key to either writing great programming for yourself or mm-hmm. getting great programming from a coach. Um, so we're going to teach you something. Don't worry. We're going to give you some tangibles here. But I just want to flip over to the strength side of the coin as well with you um, before we okay. say, okay, so what's an example of these progressions? Get a, we'll get a little more um, objective with it. Um, strength side of progressions. Now, here's it, it gets a little stickier. Whether you're a hybrid athlete, you're a road trail runner, OCR, doesn't really matter. Um, do you feel like, like for example, I think I've been doing on my push day. I do a push day every week and a, a pull day ish every week. Personally, a lot of my athletes that I coach, I prescribe similar. Um, sometimes I do like a chest back leg shoulder splits just to change it up in quotes, but the same movements are still involved as if I were doing a push and a pull. I probably have eight to 10 exercises in my push corral and I have eight to 10 exercises in my pull corral. I start with front squats. I progress to walking lunges. I do it's, it's the same thing. My performances have gotten better on the same programming. I play with the rep schemes. Sometimes, you mm-hmm. know what? I feel like going heavy on lunges today. I'm going to put that in front of my front squats. Who cares? Does it really make sense? No, but why not? I'll go 10 pounds heavier on lunges and maybe a little lighter on front squats, but that's enough change for me. And I've been in that for a decade. <laughs> okay. Like mm-hmm. between three and 10 reps for a decade. I'm not trying to get stronger. I'm trying to make my running better. So there's a caveat there. So what do you think about the strength conversation, needing to change the movements or the rep schemes all the time? Um, I had an athlete just ran his first marathon, Tomas Faria, over in Spain. And he made a great post the other day. Tomas, I know you listen occasionally. And he's had a heck of a transformation uh, over the last five years and is now is dabbling in like fitness coaching. And his post was him sort of thinner, a little flabby compared to how he is now. And then his post was the before and after he's ripped now and he's performing great. He's trying his first marathon. Um, and Tomas and I have worked together for years and he said before constant muscle confusion to think I'm tricking my muscles into growing, changing up workouts constantly doing different things all the time because I thought that's what my body needed, including what he did with his nutrition, right? And then it says after, and there's a picture of him looking good. And he has a very healthy mm-hmm. relationship with the gym and food. He's not one of those psychos, so to speak, in quotes, that is obsessed. He's not. He has a real life. And after it says, I followed progression. I did simple things with consistency. I forgot about changing things up for mm-hmm. change, change's sake. And here he is looking and feeling the best he ever has. And so... And I very much share that same sentiment, but now with this long introduction <laughs> to the floor being yours, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to start tangential as always. Uh, the whole muscle confusion concept is one of the worst things and best things that ever happened to the fitness world. Made a lot of people out of it's money. It's one of the worst things because, yeah, that's very true. Mm-hmm. It's one of the worst things though, because it uh, has no basis in reality. Muscles don't have minds of their own. Uh, They don't need to be tricked. They don't need to be confused. They just need to be stimulated. And the human body responds extremely well to repetition. Extremely well. It is based upon repetition. Everything the body naturally does is based in cycles and repetition. Uh, There's no confusion involved in it. You don't cure any disease through confusing your immune system. You don't get the most tan you can get by confusing your skin on when is it going to receive sunlight and how much are you going to give it that day. No, everything Mm -hmm. is on a cyclical pattern. That's the way we do anything. We don't confuse our bodies with when are we eating and when are we not. (laughs) Hydrating. When do we hydrate? How much do we hydrate? Your body's never going to know, and so it's going to retain all the water better and hydrate you better. That's the real hydration multiplier. It's not a thing. There's no basis in reality or physiology there. What it is is clever packaging to get people off the couch and work out each day because there's something new to look forward to. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. But So it's been really great for helping people, and it's been really bad for helping people perform. Uh, so that 
little soapbox out of the way. Where do I stand on strength is that if we had Dan John or Mark Ripito or Pavel Tussolini in this room and we asked them how to get strong or if you read their book, which you probably should, they're fantastic books in terms of uh, understanding the way the human body works, all they do is extend out the same progressions as long as humanly possible. And then they reset with something slightly different and then they get back to it and extend it out as long as humanly possible. So even if absolute strength and power was all you cared about and size, you would follow the same reps as long as you could possibly handle that before changing anything. So my reaction to that is that there's no need for anything different ever. (laughs) <laughs> ever, 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 until it absolutely has to happen. Well, and to the defense of muscle confusion or change in programming, um, it's helped a lot of people stay consistent with showing up, right? People, we, we all have a bit of ADD yep. and boredom in us. So change for change's sake, if it keeps you showing up, is better than getting bored and stopping. It's probably better than apathetically going to the mm-hmm. gym and dawdling on your phone and like not really getting anywhere because you're just bored of your routine. So... There's like you can argue both sides of the coin. Hundred percent agree. But when we, when we did our How to Run Your Best series, which was just the most recent series we did, and we're, we got, we got some ideas for more series coming up. But we're kind of doing these one offs. If you've noticed something pops up in our lives and we like to discuss it, figure if it's relevant to us, it's relevant to you. Um, but during that coaching series, we said, "Listen, we're not teaching you how to run a five k or a mile. We're teaching you how to run your best, right?" And to do Mm -hmm. your best, to be your best runner or your best hybrid athlete or your best whatever it is, to be your best, change for change's sake is not the way to be your best. And change for change's sake in the run department is not the way to be your best. Predictable stimulus following a purposeful progression is the absolute objective way to be your best if you can tolerate it. If you cannot tolerate it, then there's the second conversation about how close to that can we get Mm -hmm. and still change your programming or change my own self-prescription while I can stay mentally engaged and still progress, so to speak. So just like uh, an umbrella over the whole conversation, right? We just have to remind people of that constantly. Um, There's caveats to everything, but just for conversation's sake, that needs to be said. And it'll always need to be said. Yeah. Other than... Uh, and we should address the second side. Oh, what's that? Oh, oh other than? Oh, no. <laughs> there's a good portion of our listener base who absolutely, all they care about is getting to the finish line faster. I'm one of them. I think you are one yes. of them. Of course, we love the process. We've been told off, and that we're incorrect, by listeners. <laughs> like, I just want to get to the finish line. Like, that's okay, too. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But if we speak to performing your best, we yeah. we speak to everybody in some capacity. So anyways, most of our listeners, I think, are performance-based. Not all. But um, now go go ahead and mm-hmm. say what you were going to say. Well, now there's the other half, right? Not you, not me. People who I do want to get to the finish line as fast as possible, but I'm not going to be a psychopath along the way either. Like, I want to enjoy my life. And so the first step, I think, this is this is where I go. Are you, you calling said, us you psychopaths? How much spice and ver- Are you self-proclaimed psychopath? We would appear that way to other people, yes. That, is, that yeah. is fair. Yeah, you're supposed to enjoy exercise. Well, we do. We enjoy different parts of the process than other people enjoy. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. But so my next step then is I will deviate for people, or I recommend other people deviate. But I think we deviate just like we talked about <laughs> variables uh, before, we deviate with the variables that have the least impact on our overall goal. Mm -hmm. So if you need variety in your life, then the first place I I look for variety is where I'm running on days that I am not trying to move the needle with anaerobic intensity. Sure. I personally find that if I run different trails or different roads or different routes or watch different things on my recovery and easy days, I look forward to my quality days more. And if I go out for my easy days and I stare at my heart rate and I run the same route over and over again and see how my pace and my heart and everything are reacting to that, that sucks some life out of me. Hmm. So I get my spice on my non-spicy days 
by changing up the scenery or what I'm doing. And then it's like a relief to, okay, I get to get back to work tomorrow. That's the first place I start. I never put two and two together that way for myself, but that's somewhat what I do as well. Go hit a route I haven't hit for a yeah. while. I'll do my recovery run at 3% on the treadmill so I can catch up on my weekend races that I missed. The conference championships just happened this weekend, and there's a buttload of races on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to that and do something different because tomorrow I'm going to the roads and I'm running with purpose, with vigor, to hit splits, to get ready for my half marathon. And I do that, and I didn't even think about that. But that's a great place to start. The stuff that I don't want to say doesn't matter, but matters less. Yeah. Yeah, if you deviate by 30 seconds per mile on your easy runs, you're not changing your ceiling in the 5K very much. You deviate on 30 seconds per mile on your intensity runs, it's going to affect your 5K ceiling. So start with the place where you have flexibility and be flexible. Go enjoy, explore the world, and then come back and get to work two to three times per week. I think it's a good place to start. The second is what you brought up earlier, strength training. I said it on here prior, and I'll say it probably until the end of time, unless we have such an impact on the industry that this no longer applies. But most runners don't strength train enough. And if you're not doing strength training, any strength training is better than no strength training, as long as you're not getting injured or fatiguing yourself beyond reason for your other runs. So that is where you can insert some variety. Now, you need to be honest with yourself. Am I lifting for performance or am I, or am I lifting for fun? And if you're lifting for fun, then the world is your oyster. Mm -hmm. Anything will work. I would still stay away from metabolic conditioning. A lot of that type of work will detract from your running energy and recovery wise. But if you're nailing your runs and you want to play around a little in the weight room, let's play around a little in the weight room. If that's what refills your cup and regenerates your engine, sure. That's the next place where you can say, I'm doing something which is better than nothing. I'll deviate there. Spice it up. Okay. Last question about strength. Again, strength plays second fiddle a lot for us as runners, right? The third fiddle maybe, like mm -hmm. for many. Some it's not even it's not even showing up to the concert. But like anyways, so right. I'll give you two scenarios for change's sake. Okay. Whether you're a hybrid athlete, uh, road 5k or uh, or an OCR it, 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 to me it doesn't matter it, it's all black and white for me so do, what do you believe is more effective to performing your best option a the exact same six movements when you walk into the gym two different workouts a week so let's say 12 movements with the rep schemes changing throughout the year but it's always the same six you can but you're cycling rep schemes based on what you're trying to accomplish or B, instead of cycling rep schemes, you're cycling movements. So you're always, let's say, in the 10 rep scheme, but instead of Bulgarians this block, you're doing walking lunges this block. And instead of back squats, you're doing zercher squats. And then mm -hmm. this, so which one do you think for performance standpoint, literally the same shit all year, but with different schemes, or different stuff with the same rep scheme? What do you think? I have a very firm stance on this. Mm. I still think it's the same six movements over and over and over until it's not linear running. I think for maybe mountain runners, for sure hybrid racers and OCR athletes, getting some of those other movements is important. I think runners need to move one direction. And so mm. let's just... Let's just stay simple and keep out of our own way. And let's not worry about maybe performing a movement we're not ready for or used to and hurting ourselves. But the more dynamic your sport is, from time to time, the more variation you can have with your movement patterns in order to not have weaknesses somewhere in the chain. I chose both sides, Kirk, and I'm sorry for it, but I had to. Yeah, you sat right on the fence. Um I'm going same six yep. all day. Same six, change rep but, schemes. Um, and then what you're talking about could but not me, be... me, Kirk, I do same six. <laughs> yeah. And, and that can be same a personal six. preference thing. Uh, for me, it's the same six. And then let's say you're a hybrid athlete. Well, you get the other things on your skill work days 
maybe even combined with output. Like if you're doing exactly. hybrid, right, you're going to go barbell squat, parallel stance. You're never doing that in a high rocks or a DECA technically. But then in your quality hybrid run Metcon session, you're doing ram burpees or you're doing your walking lunges into a run. And so you're getting the skill work there in a sense, mm-hmm. you know? So like you're, you're still getting it if you're training or dialing in purposefully at some points. That's why I think the staple would say you're right. sense. Um, and then you could yeah. argue, hopefully a trail runner is getting on technical trails constantly at some point in the week. And at least if they're not a hybrid athlete, they're, they're getting on the specific terrain, which hopefully sharpens that, that arrow in their quiver. Um, okay, let's move on. So let's give them tangibles now. Um, we got 15 minutes at most left. So yeah. tangibles. Okay. So now that we're, we're stepping down from our, f- from our rock or whatever we, we choose to stay our high horse. Now that we, we've sort of at least shoved our opinions down your throat in this regard, what should that look like? Somebody who's programming themselves. Um, let, let's give a couple examples, maybe personal examples of how that could look. Let's talk the run front first. Like you did start to hint at it, like a flat workout, then an uphill and progress along. But, um, let's shoot a mm-hmm. couple examples out there so people can maybe apply this on their own. Well, first of all, I think the slower you work, the longer and more you can repeat something from a, from a progression standpoint. So if we're shying away from VO2 max, you know, really spicy, faster work, I don't think anyone really has a worry of, have I repeated something too long? I don't think the average person understands what plateauing really is. True plateauing is where you've adjusted all the options and you've reached your ceiling. Everything prior to that means a new variable has to be worked upon. So Mm -hmm. until you've strung together five to 10 years of increasing volume, mileage, time on feet, and all your quality, you haven't plateaued. It feels like a plateau right now, but when you look over the the scale of your life, it's going to be an imperceptible blip. So I don't think people have to worry about that. So I'm just going to say the most anyone needs to, from a physical standpoint, change things up is to alternate between flat ground and hill working or between intervals and steady continuous runs. And so I know that's not quite the tangible you're looking for, but I think that it's really important for me to drive that home. I will die on that rock. There's no more variety needed than that. Well, I think you set set it up nicely to give even more specifics. I think that was important to be said, and I agree with you. But for example, now give me an example. You want an actual workout progression? Um, like, let's say... Uh, Let's say eight weeks, eight weeks, roughly, you can zoom in or stay as far away as you want. 10,000 foot view or micro view. I don't really care. And I'll do the same. And you want to, you, do you want me to show variety or show how you don't need variety? <laughs> how you don't need variety. Yeah. Show what, what you think is best for actual progression. Okay. So, I mean, because we're big on threshold training, I would sit and twice per week, I would do a threshold workout. I would probably run the same 10 by three minutes or 10 by thousand every Tuesday. And then I would run the same 25 by 400 every Thursday for eight weeks. And I would, on the thousands, I would put a predetermined pace limiter on it. So I'm going to start at six minutes per mile and I'm running my thousands at that and I'm going to track heart rate. And as soon as my heart rate average for the day, let's say I set it at 160, as soon as it drops below 160 on any one of my workouts, the next time through, I'm moving it to 550 pace. Mm. And I'm doing that for eight weeks. I'm just running the same RPE and seeing what my heart rate and pace do for eight straight weeks. And in the 400s, I'm doing the same thing. I'm running these at 75 seconds. And then when that RPE, when that rate of perceived exertion drops, then I'm running them slightly faster. If I'm not doing heart rate monitoring, if I'm not doing blood lactate testing, if I'm not using ventilation as my indicator, then it's purely RPE. And then my weekends are my time for my variety. I'm Hmm. alternating long runs and hill runs. And that's it. That's all I'm doing because I'm tracking how much better I'm getting. 
not how much my workouts are changing. At the end of eight weeks, you can see exactly how much better you've got at those two different things, which balance each other out very nicely. Combined with the fact that my eight weeks of long runs have gotten better, I know that all ends of the spectrum have improved. I'm ready to either race or do the next stage of training. So you're looking at pace or effort based on heart rate data, for example, as your indicator of progression, just because you're still doing the same boring 10 by three minutes doesn't mean there isn't fitness progression in there. You would expect it and you embrace it and then follow it throughout the the block either. And, you know, just to add to that, it could be like, okay, is my pacing getting faster at the same heart rate? That's a great indicator. Or I'm going to stay at six minute pace, but I was taking 75 seconds rest last week and this week it's 60 seconds rest. And then the next week it's 45 seconds Beautiful. rest. The nuances in there are limitless. Those micro changes, it's still the same workout. For me, that's enough to keep me on the hook. Um, I, for you, we know it is. You could get a give yourself a second less rest and you'd be like, oh my God, what a different workout. 74 seconds rest versus 75. That's progression right there. And you wouldn't be wrong. Yeah if you ran the same pacing with one second less rest. So variety on the weekends then. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's what, what it would be. My, okay. Or I would have A week and B weeks. A week would be flat uh, thousands and technical terrain 400s. And the next week would be hill thousands. And the next week would be flat 400s. Or instead of technical, it might be hills. And I would just alternate those two. So now I have four weeks of each. If I wanted to change it up a little bit and change the stimulus for my legs, not for my engine, but for my ankles and feet and uh, the skill of running different things, that's those are the only adjustments I'd make, really. Hmm. So I disguise mine just a little bit more, I think, for my own sake. Like Maybe that's what bleeds into my programming from time to time, but... I very much go uphill one week, flat the next week, back and forth. With a slight progression, it might be Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do a 30-minute uphill tempo this week, and maybe I make that a five-mile flat tempo the next week. And then maybe it's a 35-minute uphill tempo the following week with a six-mile tempo. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of ratchet down with the goal being running roughly similar effort and pacing but extending it out. And then the second workout of the week may be the spice. Maybe I do 90-90 uphill, snuck and do a long run. Yes, I do some of my long runs on the treadmill like a psychopath for an hour 45. And then the next might be quarter mile on off, which is really you're working with roughly the same time domains, roughly the same output, right? just translated. And then progress those you know, back and forth. But a lot of the setups are very, very similar. Maybe on paper they look just slightly disguised, but they're not. They're really not. Um, no. So um, things like that. And then, of course, this all gets tricky when it comes to what you said, or what I said, the distraction of a race in quotes. Then, of course, we sort of right. start throwing the novelty with the faster turnover sessions and some different uh, interval variation setups, of course. I can see you want to add to that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to add anything to that. You've nailed it. No. I think we've driven that home down. I think that there's a different side of the coin that's as effective, but it needs a longer term approach. So you said you have eight weeks. I'm not deviating. That is a precious amount of time as a runner. There is the runner that I will program for, and I've done it with myself in the past when during off seasons, where I say, on these Tuesdays, I'm getting 30 to 40 minutes of between 10k and 15k paced work yep the workout itself does not matter to me because that's not muscle confusion that's mental confusion that's all it is i'm doing the same 30 to 40 minutes of 10k to 15k paced work and whether that's a one two three fire lake or 10 by a thousand or three by 10 minutes or shoots and ladders Six up and down the mountain it doesn't matter because i'm Yeah, I'm running the same effort. I'm getting the same time on feet. It's just an entirely new mental approach to the workout every time. And on Saturday, I'm accumulating 70 minutes of sweet spot training. Whether that is through KDE, five-minute reps of running after pulling a sled, or if that is through 
running my murder mile loops out on my ski hill. It doesn't matter because I'm getting 70 minutes of this 155 to 160 beats per minute work. That's the other side of this. But you need a long, a longer timeline to, to see your fitness change because you can't really tell what's going. I mean, your fitness is going to change with either route. But for you to see it and feel it, you have to hit the workout again. Yep. So if you give yourself five different workouts, it's going to take 10 weeks before you feel any change workout to workout basis. So neither's wrong, but that is the other way. It's going to get the least amount of time on here, but that's what you do if you really need muscle confusion. You give yourself mental confusion and you give yourself different labels for doing the exact same thing every single week. Yeah. And when I look at creating workouts, the parameters like, all right, we got to get, we got to get this woman to spend 30 to 45 minutes in threshold today, roughly. How do we do that? And it can be disguised in a number Mm -hmm. of ways for mental confusion, but ultimately metabolic stimulus wise, your heart rate beat roughly for the same amount of time in the same rough zones we want it to, whether you're doing a workout or B workout or C workout. Right. Um, yeah. So, so then, so I agree with all of that. Um, what about like, okay, the distraction of racing then do you think that that is the time then for some confusion or do we go to old staples then too? this worked for me in the past? Do I go back to it or do yeah. I, do I, um, play? Right. And for me, it's like, as long as we are at or faster than race pace at or effort at some of our sessions here, we're probably accomplishing what we need to accomplish. Um, but I don't know. What do you think there? When you hit a racing block of the season, what I resort to are my most tried and true easiest versions of whatever I'm trying to accomplish. So if I, I, I resort to the simple, bland, vanilla workouts because races are so stressful. I want something mm. you don't have to think too hard through. You can just go out and perform it. But if there's like an A, a B, or a C version in terms of difficulty, I'm staying with the C. Like We know it moves the needle. We know it's effective for you, but it's the least damaging mentally and physically and recovery afterwards. I live in those in between races, knowing that the A to A plus effort of the race balances out the B minus to C plus effort of this workout. Yep. And as a result, we're going to keep at least stable, if not progress, but I choose stress-free workouts, things that look really approachable on paper. So that it's like, all right, I can't do my Tuesday or Wednesday, but by Thursday, I'm going to have to be ready for a workout. Oh, it's that workout. Okay, I can hit that on Thursday. That's all I want. I want that. Oh, I can get that. That's the feeling I'm targeting in between races. How about, um, and I agree with that, especially if you're racing, let's say like every three weeks or something, it's like, you may not feel like you're Mm -hmm. a hero in any particular other quality session. Hopefully you feel like a hero on race day and we get you back to that feeling for then again, but you shouldn't be feeling like a hero in those training sessions in between. Um, but what about like, let's say we follow, we got a race in 12 weeks that we really care about. And we followed this eight week build. We already outlined, you know, that you talked about, but it's the final four weeks. Um, you're not over racing. I mean, there should be some sort of thought of progression here. Right. Um, but I know like there could be a very clear example. Let's say you have a 5k well, now you do half mile repeat variations all the way in with playing with the rest or playing with the tempo or pacing, or you could repeat the same thing even in, in your peaking pursuits. I would say if there is a time to play with different pacing and different efforts, it might be then, um, but you necessarily yeah. wouldn't have to either. You don't have to peak to race well. And that's something that people can relax on. Like, all right, I don't have to peak to race well because I did great in workouts all this way along. Right. But so the simple thing is to keep doing what you're doing and make 50% of your workouts uh, on a race specific terrain or demands. That's the easiest way to possibly prep for a race. The other ones you can start making faster if you want, faster than race pace to get ready for it. But simply four weeks out, start choosing race specific terrain and demands at least half the time. And you're ready to run an A race. may not be your A+, plus, but it's not going to be a D. In right. peaking, some people can kind of get it wrong sometimes, and then they, they run a D race. And this I think it's safe. like, don't, ab- don't abandon everything about your lead-in, right? Keep a number of those components. Yeah. That non-flashy thousand workout you talked about every week. Well, let's keep that in there and keep a progression there, and then let's change the other stimulus to maybe 
more race specific, either pacing terrain, like you said, but don't forget what got you there, right? Don't forget the people who helped you get to where you're going to get once you're big and famous and fast. It's the same thing goes with like, what like what really got us there? And it's going to be the simple, exactly effective work, and it should always be in there. Um, okay, well, what else do we have to add to this conversation? I think what what I what we want to get across is like you don't need to be changing things up all the time to progress. Whether you're self coached, whether you have a coach, um, like similar workouts prescribed over duration, absolutely can and will move the needle for you. It doesn't have to be some crazy outside the box thinking constantly for you to like get forward progress with your fitness. It just absolutely isn't necessary. And if you follow some of the best training groups in the world, I mean, progression tempos, um, you talk about the exact same hill repeat workouts in the off season for track athletes and then they progress to thousands on the track and then they progress and you know what they take a reset and when next season comes around they start right back where they started the one year prior with the same dang progression that they did last year and the hope is they do it a little better i remember in college we did almost the identical progressions before track season turn in the log to coach and coach would compare the log from last year to this year and say same workout Mm -hmm. half a second faster you are well ahead of last year great. And there's so much power in that versus getting done with a workout, feeling good about it, but then having nothing to compare it to I mean, like, I did well, but like, how do I even know where I'm at comparatively? Like there's some objectivity to duplicate exactly. and replicable workouts that build confidence. In fact, builds more confidence than just throwing crap at the wall and seeing what stick. And if you haven't experienced the confidence built by consistent workouts that are repeatable, um, you definitely are missing out in some capacity. And I need to work on that in my own programming, actually doing more of of that sort of like boring, repeatable stuff. So um, I don't know. Any last thoughts on it all? I'm going to wrap like I often do, which is finish with what I started with. To draw that line in the sand and be honest with yourself where you, where you are, where you're standing. Are you on the enjoyment side? You want your food to taste great? Or do you want your food to fuel you? Or do you want a bit of both? I think that's what you have to decide. And once you decide that, your path becomes very clear. But simply repeating something and doing it better is a change to programming. It is. Hmm. And have some confidence in that rather than some trepidation. I think that's a good spot to end. That's Is that all we got? That's what we got. That's what they're getting. Thanks for coming today, folks, and listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. Um, if anything, maybe a little bit of peace of mind or a push in one direction or the other when it comes to deciding what you do when you slip on your your alpha flies for your next quality session. We'll see you later this week. And if you think I'm talking directly about you, I'm not. It was the other person. <laughs> uh-huh. All right, guys. See you later. <laughs>